So yes, we are in the middle of a sermon series we've called Rooted. We're just kind of being reminded of those things that as a church we are most deeply rooted in. We're rooted in Christ, we're rooted in the Word, we're rooted in grace, we're rooted in a thing called the Reformed tradition. And the Reformed tradition has this little saying that helps us get at what we're rooted in. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to the scriptures alone, to God's glory alone. So these first five weeks of this series, we've been working through each of those so-called solas, the word for alone in the in Latin and today's is the fourth one sola scriptura and so we're going to be in Mark chapter 7 and uh, and Luke will forward those slides as we go but before we do that let me pray Lord we do confess that your word is a lamp unto our feet so as we open it now may it illumine our path help us to see the way in which we should go based on your will, your ways, your desires, your glory. And all your people say, Amen. Amen. So this is the beginning of Mark chapter 7. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? And Jesus replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human tradition. And Jesus continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother. And anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corban, that is, devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus, you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many things like that. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So walk with me uh, back through this text because I want to get us present to what's happening here and it's easy to miss it just reading through it once. But the leaders of the Jewish community, they're questioning Christ about why his disciples eat without washing their hands, which as you might imagine um, is not what you might think it is. It's not parents saying, hey, go wash your dirty hands before dinner. This is not about hygiene. It's not about hygiene. It was a custom started by their elders and among them as Pharisees and teachers of the law, it was a custom that they would ceremonially cleanse themselves from any defilement that they perceived they had picked up, especially with the Gentiles. You notice that it said out in the marketplace, they're interacting with those other people. They've become impure, so to speak, unclean. And so it wasn't about hygiene, it was about spiritual purity, and thus the hands weren't just dirty, they were defiled. And this whole activity and the attitude behind that activity was not specifically part of God's commands, but was actually a human tradition that had evolved in, human, in Hebrew culture over the years, had been added to God's commands. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they note that Christ's disciples are not conforming to this tradition. And and you can kind of feel it. They feel like they've kind of got them in this gotcha moment. Like, ha, we see what you're doing over there. We see that you're not washing your hands. You're not a real rabbi. These aren't real disciples. Look what you're doing and look what they're doing. You know, explain yourself. And now Jesus, um, he's going to eventually answer their specific question. That's what the next passage is about. He gets at 
what actually defiles and doesn't defile. Um, but before he does that, knowing that the attitude and the condition of the heart that's coming forth, they, he kind of flips the tables on them and focuses the attention right on their hearts and on the ways in which some traditions that they've established stand actually in the way of what God truly desires. And so he quotes two things that God had said through the mouth of Moses. Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father and mother or mother is to be put to death. And so God comm God's commandments required that the Hebrew people honor their parents, which wasn't merely about like just sort of lip service about honoring their parents. It was in, in their actions in the way in which they took care of their parents' needs. And yet what Jesus gets at is that some of the Jews had concocted this scheme to avoid parental responsibility. They would designate a certain portion of their financial resources as korban, korban, which is the Greek word, it's based on the Hebrew word, korbanas, uh, which is an offering, an offering to God specifically usually had something to do with offering it to the temple treasury in Jerusalem. And so according to this tradition, one could designate certain resources as Corbin, which practically speaking was a way of sort of, sort of tagging those resources. Uh, these belong to God, not to be used for personal matters. Consequently, certain Jews could use this to callously neglect their obligations to their own parents through this sort of perverted tradition. It would look pious. This money's Corbin. It's, it's devoted to God. It's going to the temple treasury. What could be better than, than this? And it's interesting that Jesus himself is saying, I don't want your money. <laughs> because in doing so, they violated the law of God with respect to honoring their father and mother by taking those resources away from the ways in which they're supposed to honor their father and mother. And so on this occasion, when they had the nerve to question Jesus and his participation in certain traditions and his, their apparent sort of um, breach of rabbinical tradition, Jesus points out their hypocrisy and he quotes from the prophet Isaiah. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship, they worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules, i.e. they're very fond of quoting the law given to Moses, thus they honor God with their lips, but they fail to see how their own traditions make void those very scriptures, or as it says in the text, nullify exactly what God intended. And so they end up teaching certain things as though they're divine doctrines, but they're really human rules, human traditions. And and, and this mistake, like many of the mistakes of the Pharisees, is not limited to the Pharisees. So those of you who were with us last summer, when I asked us all to say, you might realize, or to realize that you might be a Pharisee, and to turn to your neighbor and realize you might be a Pharisee. I wonder if you could do that again. Turn to your neighbor and say, you might be a Pharisee. <laughs> you might be a Pharisee. I might be a Pharisee. So this is not about Jesus getting them. This could just as well be Jesus getting us. Because in fact, the same mistake that the Pharisees make in this particular occasion is repeated over and over and over throughout history, which is one of the reasons why we have to be students of history and of church history. So with very good intentions, we humans, we attempt to simplify scripture or we attempt to apply it within a certain context. And despite our best intentions, our depravity regularly gets in the way and repeatedly gets in the way. So what do I mean by depravity? It's a word that I mentioned a couple weeks ago, kind of a popular word within the reformed theological tradition. Um, it's a word that literally means crooked, crooked. Um, so crooked compared to what? Well, crooked compared to how God originally intended us to be. So some people, some, yeah, you'll hear it said in some ministry environments, 
People will talk about sin, talk about how messed up you are, how depraved you are, how crooked you are, and, and it almost makes it feel like you should feel guilty about that, which is to some extent, but the Bible actually says it's not your fault. It's not your fault that you've actually inherited this crookedness, that it's an innate part of your human nature, of every person's human nature. And so you can't even get out of it. And it's not just that us humans are born with this tendency to do a few things that God doesn't desire, but it's that we're born with such a distorted nature that we can't straighten ourselves out, right? We're depraved, we're crooked, and we can't straighten ourselves out. We can do some things that God desires, but ultimately we need something from the outside to work on us in order to actually straighten us out and make us right with God again. And so thank God that he gracefully intervenes and through his word and spirit helps us recognize how much we need this intervention, this intercessor, this mediator, and then he gives us that remedy in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. But left to our own devices, we are prone to all sorts of crooked foolishness. All sorts of crooked foolishness. To carry out all sorts of actions and attitudes that do not reflect the desires of God. And worst yet, and this is the most important part for today relative to Mark 7, we are so mired in crookedness that we have trouble even seeing our own crookedness. We are so mired in crookedness that we have trouble seeing our own crookedness. And so, like the Pharisees here in Mark 7, with very good intentions, we attempt to simplify the Holy Scriptures or apply it to a given context. And in those attempts, our depravity regularly, repeatedly gets in our way. So specifically, it causes us to A, get things wrong, and B, to fail to realize that we've even got it wrong. So our depravity causes us to think our applications are the truth, even though they're simplifications or applications of a greater truth. And they may speak back to that truth, but they're adjustments to it. And so over and over and over again throughout history, we hear the call of various people saying, wow, we might need to re-examine this choice we've made about how to express ourselves about how to be faithful to God in our behavior, about how to practice our faith. And so we need to see whether or not the choices reflect God's intentions as revealed in the scriptures or whether they reflect our intentions in our own hearts. And so maybe our good intentions ran us astray in the beginning or maybe our good intentions have run their course. We just, in, in all of it, people are asking us, we need to ask ourselves whether or not what we believe and what we're saying and what we're doing is really reflective of God's word, of what God has revealed to us. And that is what the Reformation is all about. And the most famous act of the Reformation that we mark as kind of kicking off the record of Reformation, even though there was a bunch of stuff that happened before it, was this act that's depicted in this painting of Martin Luther nailing his 95 theses to the door of the church in Wittenberg. And each of the 95 theses are arguments as to why the current practices of the church at that time in the early 1500s, why those current practices did not align with what the Bible actually said. So in other words, it's Martin Luther's attempt to reenact what's happening in Mark 7, and he's aligning himself, trying to stand with Jesus. He's saying, man, we've got some human traditions here that are not only being passed off as God's own, but are actually working to obstruct or nullify what is God's. The most notable of which was indulgences, that is paying for forgiveness. You pay, then you can go and indulge, right? Indulgences, paying for forgiveness. So not only is that act not found in the scriptures, but it also obscures one of the most important points in all the scripture, that we are forgiven by the sheer grace of God, not anything we do. That salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to the scriptures alone. And so Luther, among many others, was like, we need to reform this thing. Reform it. 
Didn't totally want to separate, just wanted to reform it. And so what I want to do is get into some of the moves they made because those moves not only protected the church back then against some of the dangers highlighted in Mark 7, but are still important for us to this very day. So I want to get into a few things. So one is just pretty simple. Just adhere to this principle, scripture alone. That scripture alone is the final authority in life and faith. And so there's nothing to be added to it, which Christ kind of makes this allusion to in Mark 7, but we get at it even further in all sorts of other passages, including this passage from Revelation 21. This is right at the end of the Bible. There's only two more verses after these verses, but it says, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of this book, the book of this prophecy, God will take away that person's share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. I.e., this is kind of closed from any further additions. That the word is final, nothing's going to be added to it or taken away from it, and nothing needs to be adjusted, which is what Paul says in his letter to Timothy. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be a proficient, equipped for every good work. So scripture has everything we need for every good work God would have us do so that all of us might live the way God intends for us to live. Now that doesn't mean it's not, it doesn't require our interpretation, our application to the various things. There's tons of things in modern life that it doesn't talk about. It doesn't talk about television, your cell phone, your car. It doesn't talk about any of those things specifically. But it does have something to say about all our relationships and all our behaviors and the way in which we live. And so this is the way the Westminster Confession of Faith, one of the things that I'm trying to do in this whole rooted thing is to expose you to some of the ways that people wrote out their faith back then. This is the way the Westminster Confession of Faith said said some things about sola scriptura. First of all, it lists the 66 books of the Bible. It says these are the books that we believe are part of the Bible. That's really important. Where else would we go if we don't access something that tells us? And then it says the books of the Bible, those 66, were given by inspiration of God to be the rule of faith and life, which is something we often hear. It's our only rule in faith and life. That phrase comes from somewhere. It comes from a document written in the 1600s. Um, And, which also says, the whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith and life, is either expressly set down in scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from scripture, unto which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelations of the spirit or traditions of men, i.e. all people, women too. And... So yeah, so it's saying, hey, it says some specific things, but then there's all sorts of things that can be deduced from it. So it doesn't tell us exactly how we should navigate our life with our phones, but there's things that can be deduced, deduced about principles we could apply the way we use our phones, etc. right? And says this, all synods or councils since the apostles' times, whether general or particular, may err. I.e., we're just depraved people that can mess some things up, and many have erred. Therefore... They are not to be made the rule of faith or practice, but to be used to help in both. And that's a really good qualifier at the end. It's not trying to say scripture alone, chuck the rest of it. It's saying scripture alone is the final authority. And that things, even like itself, which it's it's commenting on itself. (laughs) Uh, Because otherwise it's like, don't even listen to, to this. If you think nothing matters but the scripture, don't even listen to the Westminster Confession of Faith. It's not trying to say, don't listen to me as though it has a personality. Um, It's trying to say those things can be of a help. What we've said in our tradition is that things like the Westminster Confession, the Heidelberg Catechism, the Belgic Confession, they are historic and faithful witnesses to the word of God. That that's what's most important. It draws out what's most important about the word of God to our life together and the general principles that can be drawn. And so it's a help for understanding the word of God. It is not the last and final authority scriptures are. And so we watch out for the human traditions we add and try to 
have these confessions that help us guide it because it's a big, fat book with a lot of stuff going on, and it's helpful sometimes to summarize it and understand it. So one of the things is don't add anything, always going back to the scripture is the only rule of faith and life. But another thing was that uh, there was an encouragement to be open to reform. So as the reformers came along and thought, man, the the church is crooked. It's kind of gotten off the tracks. Well, what does it look like to be the true church? This is something I introduced to my class a couple weeks ago. Article 29 out of 37 in um, the Belgic Confession says these are the marks of the true church. It's three things. The church engages in the pure preaching of the gospel. It makes use of the pure administration of the sacraments as Christ instituted them. And it practices church discipline for the correcting of faults. So pure preaching, right administration of the sacraments, and practices church discipline. And I said more in that class. You could go back and and, uh, watch it. There's recordings of it and the notes of it. I don't want to say too much about it, but I want to jump to another part of Article 29, which talks about this in comparison to the false church. Because it makes a comparison of what could be done instead. And the text is a little smaller up there, but this is what it says. The false church assigns more authority to itself and its ordinances than to the word of God. It does not want to subject itself to the yoke of Christ. Which is easy for us human beings to do. We get, we love the control and to surrender that control to the yoke of Christ. It does not administer the sacraments as Christ, this is the false church. The false church does not administer the sacraments as Christ commanded in his word. It rather adds to them or subtracts to them as it pleases. It bases itself on humans more than on Jesus Christ. So within the church at the time, there were all these other things that were added, all these other things you needed to do to be made right to God. And the reformers looked at the scriptures and say, hey, there's only two sacraments here, baptism and the Lord's Supper. So don't add anything. Don't add anything. It's another attempt at this sola scriptura. And then this is an important part because in the first description of the true church, you think the true church exercises discipline. You think maybe it's the church exercising discipline on those people that are going rogue. But listen to this third statement. It persecutes the false church, persecutes those who live holy lives according to the word of God and who rebuke it for its faults, greed, and idolatry. So what it's saying is that the true church is open to being disciplined by those who live holy lives instead of trying to protect itself and its own faults and greed and idolatry. And that one of the ways to recognize the true church is that it is open to being reformed. It is open to having things being influenced and changed. It is open to being examined and figure out, hey, these traditions, whatever they happen to be, are they from God or from humans? And in what ways do they add to the scriptures or subtract or nullify the scriptures? Anything. You know, just even this past Christmas, we did something that was a little different, right? We had a birthday party for Jesus on Christmas morning. There's nothing in the scriptures that says have a birthday party for Jesus. Right? So it's not like just to the scripture alone. That's something we kind of did of our own volition, which you have to do in life. Not everything's perfectly laid out there. And we have to ask ourselves, was that good? Or was it, you know, blasphemous in some sort of way? I think everybody that showed up thought it was awesome. And it was, uh, of course, it added to God's word. Um, (laughs) But hey, what does it mean to be open to having those things examined? examined and to be open to reform because part of what was happening at the time of the reformation is that a ton of these people were that were saying hey we need to reform the church they were persecuted and burned at the stake and so the reformers came along and said one of the marks of the true church is that it's open to actually examining what are the faults the greeds the idolatry and that's what we see even in the contemporary church there's lots of churches Um, And I think this is important because some people have asked, hey, in the current evolution of our church, or what if we just went non-denominational? And we are specifically avoiding that because there's something to be said for being held accountable by churches that are more than just ourselves. 
And for them to open ourselves up and say, we are willing for you to point out the faults and greed and idolatry in us. Because if we went independent, totally by ourselves, then we are more prone than ever to being sucked right into our own depravity. Because even though we're saved by grace and we have a relationship with Christ and we have access to the Holy Spirit, we still make a ton of mistakes. So, yes. Part of what it means to be the true church and to exercise discipline is that we're open to being disciplined. We're open to hearing what do people have to say. We're open to being reformed. So that's the last piece, that corruption in the church is ongoing. So reformation is not needed just once. We never stop asking whether we're being faithful to God's vision and reforming the church to follow God's will. And it's necessary because humans are broken and sinful and fallen and depraved and crooked. And so in every new generation, it's easy for our sinful nature to corrupt the church. And so this is one of the phrases emerging from the, the Reformation, really important phrase, ecclesia reformata, semper reformanda, secundum verbi dei, reformed and always being reformed according to the word of God. That sometimes the way I say it around here is we call ourselves faith reformed church, and I say we should be faith reforming church, not like there was just one time that that happened as though there haven't been a bunch of depraved individuals at the helm of it since then. Um, but I should say faith being reformed church, because that's another really important part of this phrase is that one thing it, do, it doesn't mean, it does not mean the church can reform itself. Right, so notice the way it's phrased, reformed and always being reformed. It's in the passive voice. The action is being done on the church by God, by the Holy Spirit, by outside influences that the church cannot reform itself because we, that can mislead us into thinking we're the, own, we're the agent of our own reformation, but God is the agent and we are the object of God's reforming work. So reformed and always being reformed and according to what? According to the word of God. So it's not just our own whims because sometimes people have used this phrase to just as a, use it as a justification for radical innovation. Innovate however we want. We gotta change it to the, to the times and we gotta be reformed and always reforming. And that might be a misuse of the original intent because this is actually a phrase that's always calling us back to a source not always away from and to the newest in, in innovation, but actually calling us back to the source because we're just so prone to go crooked. And it's calling us back to true north. So prone to go crooked, calling us back to true north, calling us back. What would the word of God have to say? What does God's story have to say about it? Because Jesus didn't give us all these specific instructions. Meet at Sunday at 9.30 a.m., meet in this particular way, have a center section full of chairs and side sections full of pews, right? It didn't say any of that. Well, we've got to come up with some of it and then continually be asking ourselves and coming back to reformed and always being reformed according to the word of God. So to me... All of those things sort of summarize, how do we stay true and not fall into the Pharisee's mistakes in Mark 7? These are just three of the things that we do. We don't add or even contradict, right? Indulgence, indulgences were not only an addition, they exactly contradicted the word of God. We're open to being reformed and we're reformed and always being reformed according to the word of God. Amen? Amen. Let me pray. Lord, even as we walk away from Mark 7 here, we pray that it would illumine our steps, that your word would truly be a light unto our feet, that you would help us to be a people. Um, we we want to submit to your yoke, Christ. We want to be always aligned with your purposes in your word. Help us to understand it even better and better and better and understand what it means for our present circumstances and help us to understand all the ways in which we've layered on stuff that might not belong and in spite of ourselves, and even in the face of our best intentions, help us and correct us and lead us in your ways. And all your people say, amen.